when you come to the library and call up the manuscripts, these are probably the manuscripts that uh, many of you will be interested in. Um, we're either starting with dessert and working our way around to uh, dinner or the other way around, depending on your uh, predilections. We're going to start with the Chaucer manuscripts. Uh, for many people, these are the, the meat of the collection. Um, and then we're going to end with roles. Um, and uh, as an historian, uh, the roles are the things that really fascinate me. Um, but I understand entirely that the Chaucer manuscripts are probably what animate uh, most of you that are watching this. Um, the first manuscript that we have in front of us is called the, the Delamere Chaucer. And um, this is uh, sort of in the parlance of the library, the, the scholar's copy of the three copies of Chaucer that Professor uh, Takamiya had. Um, when, the, when we brought the manuscripts over, um, the Chaucer manuscripts were too valuable to be shipped uh, by a normal carrier. And so um, Richard Linenthal actually uh, brought them in his not in his uh, checked luggage, but brought them in his carry-ons and showed them to, uh, brought them here to the library on a Sunday. Uh, and E.C. Schroeder met him. And uh, the three of us walked in and opened up uh, these uh, suitcases that had in them the four copies of Chaucer, three of the Canterbury Tales uh, and one of the Astrolabe, which we're not going to show today. Um, and these are, it was a wonderful time. Uh, on a Sunday, there's nobody around. The library is dark. Um, and to be able to be alone with these manuscripts uh, for the first time in North America was an incredible experience and one that, that I certainly will not forget. Um, and we're incredibly grateful to Professor Takamiya for uh, choosing Yale to be the place uh, to uh, keep his manuscripts. And I hope that you'll see, uh, we've got some still pictures that we'll integrate with this video of Professor Takamiya speaking with the students here. Um, every time he comes out, we have a, a, a an opportunity for him to meet and talk with students, uh, talking with the faculty. Uh, and in fact, he was here during the, um, the Beinecke's uh, birthday, uh, 50th birthday. And we have a shot of him in the reading room with Umberto Eco, uh, both of them looking over the Voynich manuscript, which fascinated both of them. So the reason we call this the, the scholar's Chaucer of the three Chaucers is obviously not from the illumination. This is <laughs> definitely a post-medieval uh, work of Chaucer's. And the manuscript itself, you can tell, is fairly rough. Um, it has water stains. Um, the quality of the parchment, as we move around the table, you'll notice, uh, is a fairly low quality compared to um, the, uh, the Devonshire Chaucer that we're going to look at. And you'll notice the Devonshire Chaucer will have one a big column and then lots of white space around it. Whereas this copy has uh, very little white space uh, for something that we consider to be as important as a Chaucer manuscript. Um, and the reason is, is that we think that even in its time period, this was not, uh, you could certainly show it off. It's certainly a nice manuscript, but it's not going to have the visual impact uh, that the Devonshire Chaucer will have that we'll show you in a moment. Um, and instead, it's a study version of Chaucer. It's the sort of manuscript uh, that probably would have excited um, literate people uh, in the Middle Ages. And it's certainly the one that gets the most attention from scholars today. And in part, that's because of the copies of the tales are fairly early and because it's joined with several other important Middle English texts. Um, and you can see the, the layout has changed. We're back to a single column. Uh, but again, you know, no, no white space at all. Um, this has certainly been trimmed because of its current binding, uh, but still, it was never designed to be uh, a deluxe manuscript. It wasn't something that you wanted to see rather than to read. Uh, the, the joy of this manuscript comes in the reading. So um, amongst Yale faculty and Yale graduate students, this is probably the Chaucer that gets uh, the most attention. Uh, the next Chaucer that we're going to look at um, is my personal favorite, which you're not supposed to say. It's like saying you like one of your children more than another. But they don't listen ter terribly carefully. They know I love them all. Um, and this is uh, the Zion uh, College Chaucer. And what's wonderful about this Chaucer, to have this one and to be able to show it, is I've shown you uh, the Delamere. I'm going to show you the Devonshire Chaucer. Uh, this, as you can already tell, is a very small book in a lot of ways. Um, it only contains five of the Canterbury Tales. Um, it's certainly pretty. You can see there's, there's a lot more white space around it. Um, but the quality of the parchment is not, you know, it's not overwhelming. Um, the nice thing about uh, the camera work here is that you can actually see a lot of the colors and they're, you know, they're fairly accurate. Um, and the reason this is fascinating is this is, if you were to choose the five best Chaucer tales that you wanted to tell, 
Uh, this would be the book um, that you would choose. They're, you know, The Wife of Bath's Tale, The Miller's Tale. It's really a fascinating glimpse um, at you know, the, the most rivaled of the tales. Uh, Professor Takamiya calls this the gentleman's Chaucer. <laughs> he imagines you know, the nobleman with this uh, copy of Chaucer sitting by his bedside. And I like that. Uh, I think that has a real, um, a real resonance uh, to it. And one of the things I wanted to show you was um, this has a very modern binding. It's called a limp vellum binding. It, it moves like the vellum in the book itself. Uh, when this book arrived here, you can see how thick this is. When this book arrived here, it was in a 19th century binding that literally was not much thicker than this. Obviously, the, the end has come off of it. Um, and the pages were literally so tightly bound that they burst. Uh, they were breaking away. The parchment was breaking away from the spine. And so what conservation did was they had to completely uh, disbound it, uh, use humidity to soften it, and then use a vacuum uh, to cause it to lay flat before they were uh, rebind rebinding it. And um, Professor Takami was here for this. He actually got to operate the vacuum machine for a little while, uh, which I think was, you know, was a lot of fun uh, for him. And it was great to have us have people interact with it. But conservation is a huge part of what we do here. Um, these manuscripts can't just sit on a shelf. They do need people to read them. They need people to study them. But um, that kind of handling, especially as popular as the Chaucer manuscripts are, means that we need a tremendous amount of conservation work. Um, it's important that you guys be a part of that uh, when you're using them, obviously, to you know, wash your hands and to use them carefully. But also, if you notice anything amiss with a manuscript, if you see bindings that are coming apart or you see something about to tear, uh, let the staff know because we take these very seriously. We want these to be here uh, in 500 years for the next generations uh, to be able to read them. So keep that in mind. It's a sort of quarto size. We don't use those terms in manuscripts, but a small size. Uh, and we move on to the Devonshire Chaucer. Um, this is, if ever there was a coffee table version of Chaucer, uh, this is it. Um, unfortunately, people thought so over long periods of time. And so uh, the binding itself is one of those armorial bindings, uh, definitely not a medieval binding. Um, but when you open it up, even on the very first page, this, this horrible uh, cutting here, trimming, in order for it to fill the binding, has, has cut uh, into some of the decorative work around it. Um, but as you know, with um, uh, Kathleen Smith's work on uh, manuscripts and uh, lining them, that uh, every time you add a side to a border, it becomes uh, more impressive. So if you just had one, or if you had two, or three, uh, you know, that's impressive. But all four uh, is the highest status. And you may not be able to see the illumination here, but we do have a still picture that we might be able to insert uh, that will show you. Um, this is our only medieval illumination of Chaucer that we have at the Beinecke Library. Um, it's an odd uh, illumination. Uh, Chaucer appears to be sitting uh, at a desk, but the desk is no longer there. Um, and so uh, it, it really is a very puzzling uh, image, but a contemporary image of the poet, and so very important. But after that first page, you can see what I mean about the quality of the manuscript itself. Um, tremendous amount of white space, very little space devoted to text. Um, the quality of the parchment is very high quality. Uh, if you were here, I would encourage you to feel uh, what the parchment feels like. Um, text is limited, but every time you have an opportunity to decorate uh, the text, uh, they've, they've taken you up on that. Um, so it has a lot of very interesting uh, you know, collections of Chaucer's tales. This is what we call a puzzle uh, initial, um, because it looks like pieces of a puzzle uh, that are going to be fitted together. Um, and uh, it really is a, a deluxe uh, copy. And one of the interesting things to me as an historian is um, it's very clear that both the, the Zion College as well as the uh, uh, Delamere copies were used, right? We can see a lot of dirt in the margins. Uh, with the Delamere, there's certainly markings that indicate that scholars have used the book. Uh, this one certainly has dirt around the margins, um, but it's not the kind of dirt you see from a scholar using a book on a regular basis. Um, and so whatever use uh, this had, it certainly seems to have been a very different sort of use than 
uh, we see with the other uh, copies of Chaucer that we have here. So the wonderful thing about having um, three copies, which is truly an abundance um, of, of copies of Chaucer, we would have been deeply happy to have had a single manuscript. Uh, until uh, the Takamiya uh, deposit and then acquisition, we, we didn't have any uh, Chaucer manuscripts at all. And so uh, simply having one of these three would have made us uh, incredibly happy. The nice thing about having three, is, uh, as I've shown you, is how very different they are. Um, and so we can show even to undergraduates uh, when they think of Chaucer and they think of Robertson's big, you know, edited version of Chaucer, um, they get a sense of, a, of an author that's produced a body of work. Um, and that makes a certain amount of sense. Uh, but when they see these sort of versions of Chaucer, they understand that, in fact, Chaucer could be very fragmentary. Um, it could be one or two tales. It could be five tales. Um, some of them were produced for people of means who might not have read them in the same way as uh, people that produced them for uh, almost constant reading, uh, reference, and research. So um, part of the, the beauty of Professor Takamiya's collection is that it allows us to do so much uh, with the manuscripts um, because they really are very different. So uh, for those of you that are into, uh, into literature, into Chaucer, uh, we're going to move now more into book production uh, and other types of books um, that are fascinating because uh, one of the things that um, if you get a chance to come to the Beinecke and take a look at them or uh, there is, uh, this is free by the way, it's called A Gathering of Medieval English Manuscripts. Um, and it was uh, put together by myself and Diane Ducharme and uh, Emily Ulrich. And um, I will give you an address, a bit.ly address, so that you can just download a copy of this. It's a PDF and it's available to you. And what we've done is we've organized, well, there's a wonderful history of uh, Professor Takamiya in the beginning. Um, and then we organized the books by genre. Uh, rather than by um, uh, call number, so that if you're, you know, if you're preparing a class or there's something you're interested in, uh, it's another way to find them. But the indices are, uh, if you're into the call numbers, you can you can certainly use those. Um, one of the things about Professor Takamiya as a collector is, while he certainly, you know, he <laughs> had a PhD and was very interested uh, in Mallory and in literature, uh, and therefore was able to to purchase those, he also had an incredible eye for the quality of various manuscripts. Um, there's not a single manuscript, including the Chaucer's, that is one-dimensional. Almost all of them have something really important to say about uh, book history, book production, book use, uh, provenance. Um, and so what I'm going to do is show you a few of those, uh, and, and just to give you a sampling of what's there. Remember, there's over 100 uh, books and fragments. Uh, as part of the collection. So again, these are highlights selected by uh, me and a few uh, uh, people that um, I ask for recommendations. Um, but there's there's a, really a wealth of material here. Um, this is one of my absolute favorites. <clears throat> um, and uh, the reason I love it is that it's, it's, it, it shouldn't exist. <laughs> um, it is, we think, uh, a form of advertising. Uh, we think what this is is a scribe who um, is demonstrating uh, the various scripts that he can do. And you'll notice that um, you've got each, each uh, hand, as it were, occupies a different space. And then the entire thing needs to be turned over. Um, and you can see, again, different hands uh, that are being used. Uh, and we know that professional scribes uh, use multiple hands. That's just you know what they did. Um, but this idea of advertising it uh, is very different uh, and something that we didn't know. And so this probably survived as a, as a binding uh, fragment or, or some other piece. Um, but it's not the sort of normal thing that we see and are able to collect. In fact, this is the only one that I know of that has this particular layout. Um, most of the scribal patterns that we have are uh, in book form. Um, and those are more problematic because they probably weren't being used as advertising, or if they were, um, their role is much more complex. Uh, this manuscript, uh, next to it, I've chosen uh, for vain reasons, um, and that is uh, that the other thing that a lot of Professor Takamiya's books have is um, amazing bindings. Um, this is a Doskin binding uh, that was read 
uh, and has faded to pink, but it is the original 15th uh, century binding. Um, and this is a manuscript of Cassiodorus's, um, and it is uh, Takamiya MS7. Um, and it's incredibly rare to have a binding uh, that survives this long. Um, and even the efforts to reback it um, look, if not original, certainly uh, conscious of the historicity of the volume itself. Um, and so when you see those medieval illuminations of books where they have all these books on the, on the shelves, all sort of uh, helter-skelter, um, and then these beautiful reds and blues and greens, um, normally when we have a book, it, it, it doesn't have those colors. Uh, this is a, a good example of a less uh, fancy version. Um, but you know we expect these to have uh, dark colors or uh, tans that have gotten dirty. Um, but I just wanted to show you uh, some of the beautiful uh, binding work that you can find in a collection. Uh, the, the manuscript that's next to it is a uh, book of the statutes of England. And this is also interesting codicologically rather than uh, textually. Uh, these statutes are decrees that are sent out uh, by uh, the king. And so over time, um, they increase. You know, each king gives you more statutes. And they usually begin with, um, uh, with uh, Magna Carta uh, and then uh, go forward. Um, what's unusual about this one is that it's actually been designed from its beginning to expand. Um, so when you have a new king and you have new uh, statutes, eventually those are gathered together. Um, and this is one of the only bindings I've ever seen uh, that allows you to simply add uh, more and more choirs to the original binding. So what you would do is you would slide the, the cover off of the sewing supports. You would sew on uh, your, your bottom choir, obviously. Uh, and then these are long enough that you would just thread them back in uh, and your, your book returns uh, to its, its whole format. Um, and so this is just an, an amazing uh, example of, uh, of an expanding uh, binding. Um, and shows you again, this is, you know, it's an English manuscript, uh, but it shows you Professor Takamiya's interest uh, in the, the history of the book uh, and the whole object. Um, this is uh, interesting in, in other ways. Uh, this is Takamiya 29, and it is um, a brute chronicle. Um, and what's interesting about uh, this particular one uh, is that, let me find the folio 94R. 94, just where it said it would be. Um, this was a manuscript that we think was in uh, Bishop Matthew Parker's. Uh, collection. And Matthew Parker is sort of notorious for taking a uh, red crayon uh, to his manuscripts uh, to mark them up. And obviously he was deeply interested in English history, particularly uh, the history of the church um, and church doctrine. Uh, he was looking for an original um, sort of English church. And uh, so the Brute Chronicles gave him uh, perhaps one of those sources. And we can see here what looks like just scribbles. Um, but these are very likely uh, Matthew Parker's red crayon uh, that's marking uh, this particular manuscript. Um, so this is a wonderful example, not of a manuscript important for when it was made, necessarily. I mean, the Brute Chronicle is always interesting, uh, but for the provenance. So, you know, what happens to it uh, after it's made? And in this case, the 16th century and Matthew Parker's um, markings. Okay, so just a, a few more things that we wanted to show you before finishing up. Um, uh, one of them is uh, the sort of manuscript that I really love, and that is that uh, it's, it's not what we'd call a pretty book. Um, but this is uh, Manuscript 61, and it's a medical and alchemical uh, miscellany. Uh, and the, one of the reasons we're showing it is that Sebastian Sobiecki will uh, be presenting a paper uh, at your conference, and this is one of the uh, manuscripts uh, that he's interested in. Um, and it is a wonderful manuscript, as you can tell. Uh, it, is comprised of several uh, different uh, manuscripts that have been uh, put together uh, at some point uh, in their history, um, almost like a, a notebook or um, a commonplace book. Uh, although it's obviously a little bit early for that, 
Um, and we do have a few sort of rat eating <laughs> pages uh, in the back of it. Um, but we wanted to show this because Professor Sovyashtiki is, is working on it, and we thought it would be fun uh, for you guys to, uh, to see uh, the manuscript uh, as it was uh, in its size. Uh, and again, this is a very, in some ways, inconsequential. Uh, but this is, this is the original binding. Uh, this is the original limp vellum binding. Uh, it's only been, it only has the one set of sewing holes. Um, and it's on paper. So if you think of Takamiya's collection as very highbrow, uh, it's clear that he was very interested in um, books that may not have been substantial, but contained you know, unique information. Um, and this is a wonderful example of that. Um, the last two pieces I'd like to show you are uh, some of, well, my favorites in the collection. Um, the first one is, uh, both of them are rolls. Um, and Professor Takamiya began collecting rolls long before it was in vogue. Uh, when I arrived at the Beinecke in 2012, rolls still, they were catching on, uh, but they hadn't caught on. Uh, but, you know, four years later, five years later, um, the price for rolls went through the roof. Um, uh, Professor Takamiya has uh, a long history with rolls, and when we get to the birth goal, we'll talk about that a little bit. Um, but this is the, the one on this side of the table, uh, is one that's a little bit less well known um, of Professor Takamiya's, uh, but absolutely one of my favorites. Um, I can think of a few that are similar, but none that are identical uh, to this roll. And this is a, um, a, a genealogy of the kings of England. Um, so, you know, we, we have a lot of these, uh, and genealogies are great. Sorry, roles are great for genealogy because they allow you to continue uh, the genealogy um, as, as you need to, as the family expands. Um, and so it's quite common to see these in roles. Uh, and when we were putting together the exhibit, the uh, students and I referred to this as the octopus roll, um, because there's something very, <laughs> I don't know what the adjectival form of octopus is, uh, <laughs> octopole? <laughs> There's something very interesting about the way that these um, rondels are joined together uh, with this green and red um, uh, joining lines. Um, so it's absolutely beautiful. And then, again, what's, what's sort of key about uh, talking about his manuscripts is that uh, when, when he gets them, there's never just the one thing. So having, you know, from here on up would be a very interesting role. Um, as I've said, the, the way in which it's arranged, uh, the way in which it's joined is very interesting. But then here, what you can tell is that um, the original role has ended, right? It goes down to this last rondel, who must have been uh, king, uh, which is uh, Edward. Um, and then you see a new hand take over. And what's interesting is this new hand continues, changes, changes, <laughs> um, but also the iconography changes. Um, so you have uh, Edward here connected by the, the sort of octopus-like um, tentacles, and then you have this kind of brick wall sort of diagram uh, that continues out that is, I think, intentionally different uh, than the sort of octopus roll uh, that follows it. Um, and this continues down to uh, the end of the manuscript, um, which is Henry. So it's just an absolutely a, a joyful manuscript to look at, to show to students. Um, when we had the exhibit, we actually designed a um, case that uh, you could roll uh, a facsimile of the entire manuscript. So um, we didn't have a case big enough to display this, but by using this uh, uh, wooden case with a glass front, you could scroll through the entire manuscript and get a sense of it. The last manuscript I'd like to uh, show to you is probably well known to uh, a number of you um, because this is the uh, manuscript that Professor Takamiya famously uh, stuck in a briefcase and brought to Kalamazoo. Um, this was actually the first story that I had heard about Professor Takamiya and I heard it uh, when I was a graduate student uh, a very long time ago. And uh, there was a story of this Japanese professor who also um, purchased manuscripts. And um, when uh, he was either giving a paper or someone else was giving a paper, because he's, he's very generous with his materials, um, he uh, actually brought this in his uh, briefcase to the conference. 
And interestingly, uh, Customs at either end was uh, uninterested. Um, I think he was lucky for that. I think nowadays uh, I, I wouldn't walk with a medieval manuscript through uh, TSA, but um, it's, a, it's a wonderful story, and it is true. I've asked him about it, so I'm not relating uh, fantasy tales. Um, this is uh, a birth girdle. Um, and so on the front of it, uh, you can probably see the um, what we call the Arma Christi. Um, so it begins up here with uh, the three nails uh, going through the heart and the crown of thorns, and then you have um, the flails on either side. Uh, it's important to note that the reason that the nails are so large is that in many manuscripts, they're the, they're the one thing that's supposed to be actual size. Um, they're supposed to be the size of the, of the nails themselves. And so that's why they often appear uh, large. Um, it continues down. You have the empty cross, the crown of thorns, the sop. Uh, you go down even further. And this is, uh, if not particularly English, certainly something that I've seen in a lot of English manuscripts, where they break up the body of Jesus into parts. And so you have his two hands with the hand wounds in the middle of them, the two feet with the wounds in the middle of the feet, and then uh, the sort of mandorla shape uh, that is the side wound, um, which is the, the site of devotion. Um, on the back of this, uh, which we're not able to show you, uh, is um, a length uh, and a prayer that says that the uh, Virgin Mary is uh, twice the length of the, the roll itself. And so it can function as a simulacrum uh, for the Virgin. And the idea was, uh, that uh, when Mary gave birth, uh, she gave birth uh, through her side. And the reason that was important was that, um, that Eve had been born from Adam's side, uh, the church had been born from Jesus' side, and uh, Jesus was born from Mary's side to avoid uh, contact with her genitalia that might have caused original sin uh, to infect him. Uh, as a result of this, uh, Jesus is born without sin, um, but also that Mary doesn't suffer uh, in childbirth the way that, that most women did. And so asking the Virgin Mary to have a birth like hers, uh, one that was successful, uh, one in which the mother doesn't die uh, during childbirth, was obviously very uh, interesting, a uh, very compelling uh, image. Uh, historians have asked whether or not these were actually used. Um, so far, we don't have a great deal of evidence, but. Um, Sarah Fidiment and uh, Matthew Collins uh, have been uh, looking for um, human DNA and trying to see if uh, they can find anything that uh, might be related to uh, uh, afterbirth that might be on uh, some of these that are in England at the moment. Uh, so there's certainly lots of possibility, lots of room for um, exploration uh, with this manuscript. So those are uh, a few of the Takamiya manuscripts that we wanted to show you. Um, we do hope that next year you're able to uh, travel to the Beinecke uh, and see these manuscripts. Um, and I wanted to thank uh, Professor Takamiya again for uh, choosing uh, the Beinecke uh, as the place to hold his manuscripts. Um, it's been a wonderful relationship and uh, an ongoing one. Um, and uh, next year we look forward to seeing you. Thank you. <laughs>